Hello, Life Center Rainier. We're so glad that you would come and join us this Mother's Day weekend. We're excited that we can still gather online. Go ahead and share this with someone. Tell them to come jump online with us. You know we're on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and our live.lifecenterrainier.com. And any of these platforms will serve you well. And we'd love for you to extend an invitation for someone to come and join us. And it's Mother's Day weekend. We want to say to all the women... Thank you. Bless you. We're so thankful for who you are. We believe in the spiritual principle of surrogate motherhood. See, in the the faith of God, every woman is wired with the gift God has given her to be a mother. Now, maybe you've never bore a child for yourself, but you have the gift of being a spiritual mom, a physical mom. To even think about all the moms doing so many things right now, whether you were working previously or, or, or currently, and now you're homeschooling. I just think about all the things that moms are enduring in these days. We just want to say bless you and thank you for who you are. Even a special shout out goes to the single moms. We just honor you and thank you for, for who you are. We bless you in the name of Jesus. Well, today we're jumping into the second week, or this is the third week, forgive me, of our series, Never Be the Same, Never Be the Same. And uh, we're excited to jump into a portion of scripture in Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 today, uh, we'll be talking about uh, this woman at Nain. Uh, she's known as the widow at Nain. Um, but this is going to be a great, great day. Um, if you're a note taker, feel free to write down this title. The title of my talk today is Feel, heal, and reveal. We just believe that Jesus does just those things. He feels as we feel. He heals our hurts, and he will reveal the purpose that he has for every every pain we would ever have. But join with me now. Jump into Luke chapter 7. I'm going to read this scripture to us as we lean in today. Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 11, it says this. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. Other translations said he had compassion on her. And he said, don't cry. Verse 14. Then he went up and touched the buyer. This is uh, the coffin, the mobile coffin. And they were carrying him on. And the bearers stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God, a great prophet has appeared among us, and they said, God has come to help his people. The news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. You know, in this collection of talks, uh, the series Never Be the Same, we are talking about encounters uh, of people that, that they had a moment where they engaged with Jesus, and because of that, they were left never the same. And one thing that we realize is that there's many things in this life that can impact us, but only truly Jesus can change us for all eternity. And so as we continue in these portion of scriptures, we want to exhaust and expound this and help us understand how Jesus is using this to teach us specifically. And the beauty about emotion is God has given it to us. And this friend, this lady, had a, an array of emotions, I'm sure. She was going from a place of, of dealing with the death of her son, even previous to that, um, the death of her husband, saying that she was a widow, and this was her only child that died, leaving her, ultimately in this context, unable to provide for herself. Uh, or m Women uh, were never allowed to own land, they could, she couldn't do for herself now what had been done for her, and now she's finding herself looking in the face of a dismal reality. And so there's some associated emotions there, I'm sure. And then we, we see this encounter with Jesus that he touches, he speaks to, and he does what only Jesus can do, and he raises the dead. You know, the beautiful story, testimony, if you will, of every single follower of Jesus is that oftentimes we get caught up. I don't have a good story. No, friend, it's not about whether or not you have a good or bad story. It's that we have a resurrected king that he doesn't just uh, resurrect himself. He 
is the resurrection and the life. And when we see that he has resurrected us all, we didn't go from bad to good. We went from death to life in Jesus Christ. Amen? And so we see Jesus radically intervene in this situation. But but it runs a gamut of emotions. There's a myriad of emotions here, I see. And, and these moments in our memories, they become memorials of remembrance. And all of us have an emotional memory. It's not just the events or the emotions associated with the events that link our mind to the memory. No, it's, it's this association that we have emotional artifacts. We have this recall by way of scent, or sound, or sight that are connected with some associated feelings. I don't know if you're like me, and you go into an environment, and you just, you smell something, and it brings you right back to a place. Come on, you walk into a, a, an environment that reminds you of your, your mother's cooking as a child. Great emotions. Or, or you see something that you haven't seen for quite some time, and it takes you right back to this place when, in your younger days. Or, or maybe even, even a, a scent, a sound, something you hear, and maybe it takes you to a place that isn't preferable, maybe even painful. And, and we don't have memories that are divorced from our emotions. Matter of fact, when we engage with what seems to be so distant and past and in real time, uh, th- this allows the reality to be a part of our current circumstance. That we've had associated emotions and feelings with things in the past, but now Jesus is going to use them for our current situation. Now, whether you, you've had the, the, the gift of a great mom or, or maybe uh, you weren't given the, the, the blessing of a, a, a loving mother that, that was uh, a faithful follower of Jesus that uh, pointed you in the way of, of the truth of Jesus, let me just say, we've all been given the gift of a mom in the life that we've been allowed to live. We're all only here because of a mom, but we see this mom here faced with some pain and how we feel is part and parcel to how Jesus heals and reveals all that we've endured and everything that he has for us yet to come. So go with me now to back to uh, Luke chapter 7. Uh, the first point that I want to uh, point us to here, um, we'll jump right back into verse 11 here, and I'll read this in the message paraphrase. Uh, but the first point is this. Jesus shows up in the crossroads of life even when we don't realize it. Jesus shows up in the crossroads of life, even when we don't realize it. Again, Luke chapter 7, verse 11 in the message paraphrase, it says this. Not long after that, Jesus went to the village Nain. His disciples were there with him and along with quite a large crowd. So there's a big crowd coming with Jesus. And and there's a couple couple worlds that that he's living in in this moment. He's coming with this crowd that lives in the world of wonder. They've watched Jesus perform miracles. They've watched him uh, reveal himself as Messiah. And now he walks right in the path of this woman. It says, as they approached the village gate, they met a funeral procession. So what happened here is two worlds collided, right? The world of wonder and the world of mourning. And and this world is ultimately, uh, as I'll give a definition to this this concept, is cognitive dissonance. This is, is by way of definition. Cognitive dissonance is this. The state of having inconsistent thoughts, beliefs, or attitudes, especially as relating to behavioral decisions and attitude change. Uh, one way is to say this is that when two concepts different than each other collides. So we see these, these two concepts come together at this point, and we're seeing this collision, the world of mourning and the world of wonder. And so this is like saying when faith and fear collide, right? Hope of life in the face of death. We're seeing the wonder of God in his goodness and grace come and face this woman, right in the procession of a funeral. And when these two crowds meet, there's this cultural, emotional, and spiritual differences that Jesus enmeshes these two groups for one purpose, and that's to reveal he has great compassion and is very kind to all of us in our time of need. 
you know, uh, this crossroads, this concept of these two worlds colliding. When I was a young person, there was a, a, a song out there from Bone Thugs and Harmony, Meet Me at the Crossroads. Don't Google it. I think there's some profane language in there, but that's before Jesus has done a work in me. Amen, okay? But you, you, you understand this crossroads is this cross-connection point where these two worlds collide. And I don't know if you're like me, where you've experienced some traumatic things in your life in the past. And anytime you have this encounter with pain and, and you have to continue to move forward in life, maybe you've been given a bad report from the doctor at one point and the doctor's trying to give you information and you're just kind of going, I don't, I don't know where I am right now. Or you've had a, a bad accident and, and you've had this encounter that, that left you kind of confused and not knowing which way was up. But traumatic experiences in life, oftentimes, uh, the, these moments, they're painful, these circumstances, and, and they can provoke some emotion. And things in that moment can kind of feel like a, a blur, kind of surreal, and you don't necessarily remember everything in that moment. You know, when people go through crisis, when people find themselves in the most painful circumstances, that's where we as a body of believers get to go and be an active presence. You know, there's this saying that I think is beneficial to all of us that would call ourselves followers of Jesus, and it's the ministry of presence. And this is us just being there, going beyond what we could ever say and, and, and keep reminding ourselves it's not what I say in the moment, but it's who is in front of us. That, that the moment that people will see us in their presence will make all the difference. That it's not what I say in that moment, but it's who the people see. And do they see the people of Jesus? Do they see Jesus? That, that they might see him, you or me, through us in the moment, but in retrospect, remember. Because in the moment when your world is crashing down, we don't necessarily recognize all that's going on. But later, there's things that are revealed. And for me, I just remember moments where it seemed like my world was crumbling, only to recall later that Jesus provided in a, in a way that I could never provide for myself. I think back on some of the most difficult moments and worst decisions. I think back in these times, in these moments when, you know, things could have been so much more worse, but they didn't. And then Jesus is right there in my pain, my ugliness, and he shows himself to be present even when I didn't see him. In retrospect, I can remember. Because in this life, we can't connect the dots forward, but we can always connect them back. And when we don't see Jesus in the midst of our circumstances, we need just to take a time to pause and start to see that the peace that he plays is in the person of presence. And Jesus steps right in the road in the face of this woman as she is in the smack dab middle of grieving the loss of her son. And so his presence is so prominent. In the absence of life, the giver of life shows up on the scene. And we see that Jesus shows up in the crossroads of life, even when we don't realize it. Okay, number two, if you would, write this down. Number two, Jesus gives the greatest purpose to our deepest pain. You know, we all have an aversion to pain. No one's signing up for painful things in life, yet Jesus uses the most painful things in life to reveal our greatest purpose. I was talking with a friend not too long ago, and, and uh, we were talking about what shapes us, what helps ultimately reveal the character flaws, and, and really compels us to follow Jesus, and it's suffering, we all want to strive for happiness, but ultimately we're shaped through suffering. That's a hard concept because no one's trying to sign up to suffer. Luke 7, 14 and 15, it says this, Then he went up and touched the buyer. This is the, basically the mobile coffin. And they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk 
and give Jesus, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. See, the things that have been taken away from you and I that are seemingly dead and cannot be raised to life are given back to us when we allow Jesus to, to touch them and speak to them. And what we allow Jesus to touch and speak to will come alive and start to speak to us. It says that this boy sat up and started to speak, that Jesus then gave him back to his mother. And, and, and the thing about what it means to have an aversion to pain is that we want this healing and we want back what we lost. We just don't want to endure the suffering that, that we have to sustain to get there. Uh, when, whenever my kids get hurt, say they scrape their knee or something, they always come to me for comfort, but they don't necessarily want me to touch the most painful part, the wound itself. And, and for, for me to help bring healing, it requires me to be able to touch the most sensitive part of what they're enduring. And so maybe there's something that you and I have put the nail in our coffins of the things of past, that we don't believe that there's any way it can have life again. But let me just tell you, if you're willing to let Jesus touch it, he can and will bring it back to life. And he will start to speak to us through it if we allow him to touch and speak to it now. And we got to allow him to speak to it in such a way. Why? Because when we went through what we went through, it wasn't for us just to endure pain. It's for us to produce something powerful that someone else's life would see change through us. And we all have this aversion to pain. But just remember, in our pain is where Jesus reveals his greatest purpose for our future. And, and the thing that I'll say, take note to this, awareness is curative. And until we're aware of the very depth of our pain, we cannot receive what the cure is for our ailment. We can't let Jesus ultimately intervene, intercede, and speak to the depths of our pain until we let him come close and touch it. And this mother just lost her son. She's a widow, and now she probably is going to become a beggar. And sometimes we just think to ourselves, come on, you know, uh, time will heal all things. No, time does not heal all things. Only Jesus heals all things. And the Bible says that he is the great physician. And he has to come to connect, to engage with the deep, painful parts of our life. And he has to clean the wound. And he has to suture the wound. And he has to bandage it. And we have to give ourselves, not just to feel, but to allow him to heal. But first comes the shot of anesthesia so that he can administer us. And the very first touch is always the most painful. But friends, if we give ourselves to the person of God... And allow the great physician to do what only he can do. He can take the deepest parts of our pain and reveal his greatest purpose for our lives. Amen? Amen. Okay, number three, last point in this. Jesus uses our pain to reveal his greatest compassion for all. He uses our pain to reveal his great compassion for all. See, there's a scent or a sound or a sight that once traumatized us. This woman was walking on this road, and she had an encounter with Jesus to leave her never be the same. But it, but it came at this cost. For her to see the miracle of God, it came at the cost of her being in the depths of the most miserable moment of her life. And we see that this was traumatizing. And now the very thing that he uses to ignite us, to use us, is the pain that we've endured so far. And this will produce in us a great compassion for other people in their pain. Luke 7, 13, it says, when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. Again, I read this part previously, but I want to make sure that, that we engage with this one portion. It says that his heart went out to her. And other translations said he had compassion for her. And he said, don't cry. And then he went and touched the area of pain, the coffin. You know, when I was younger, the only time I ever told somebody, don't cry, 
is when uh, maybe I had a, a scuffle or, or an encounter with one of my siblings and I was the person to blame for their pain. And I was like, shh, no, 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 don't, don't cry, don't cry. Don't, I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> I don't know if you're like me, but that's been the case in my life. And here's the truth about Jesus, though. Jesus didn't cause our pain, but he will use our pain to reveal his great compassion for all. And so we see him speak to this woman and to the circumstances. And this is, this is him coming to the conversation now and saying, don't cry. And I would just think if there was any time to cry, right, right now would be the time. Like, why would you say don't cry, Jesus? This seems kind of like an insult to injury. How insensitive. What lack of awareness. But no, he, he knows what he's doing in this moment. He's speaking, revealing the great compassion of God. He's saying, listen, I cry, I feel too, so that I want you to know I feel as you feel. I am human. I am deity. I'm God in a bod, 100% God, 100% man. This is the incarnate person of God. Jesus Christ came in the form of flesh to die on a cross to save us of our sins. And we see him now in this circumstance reveal himself as God, but he's also speaking to the emotions. And he's not saying, hey, don't cry because there's nothing to cry about. He's saying, hold on, just wait a minute. I got something for you. I feel like you feel. Like John eleven thirty five 35 says, Jesus wept. Why did Jesus weep? Because his friend died. And he feels as we feel. Now he's doing, the, what he's revealing here is empathy for this woman. I know how you feel. And, and it's more important that we don't wish away the pain. Because that's what reveals that we're alive. Pain is an indicator of life. If we don't understand that we're going to have associations of circumstances, we're going to deal, whether it's something of the past that ignites an emotion that we once had to deal with, or it's the reality of what today has to offer. We have to know that even though in the midst of what this world would say is dead, dormant, and done, put a nail in it, there's no way it's coming back again, Jesus will speak to it, heal it, resurrect it, and give it new life. And he will use our pain to reveal his great compassion for all. And he wants to engage with us through our emotions because how we feel about him and others matters to God. And when, when we understand that death does not have the final say, we get to see this thing from a whole different perspective. Romans 6, 9 says, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him, right? So when death doesn't have mastery over you, we no longer have an aversion to pain because we know we can endure pain if it doesn't produce death. Friends, we can endure the difficulties of today because we have eternal life with him. This is when we know how good he is, that there's purpose in the path of him meeting us in the face of our pain. There's purpose with allowing him to touch the most sensitive areas of our life and speak to the death, but to call forth life out of it. We need to do what he did, and he stayed in front of people when other was, others would go by the wayside. We need to allow our lives to be the change agent in other people's worlds, that we would stand up when others sit down. We would be willing to engage when others disengage. We are the people of God that will love like Jesus loves, and we will lean in when others are leaning out. And this is how we know what he's given us is greater than us. That he will use our pain to reveal his great compassion for all. And the way that we show the great love of God, loving this invisible God is best put into practice by loving visible people. When you see someone in front of you in pain, that's our cue to engage. Because we understand that there's nothing that says that Jesus was asked to engage here. It just says that he got well on his way. He, he walked uh, 20 plus miles. He brought disciples with him. He was on this journey, willing to go and cross paths, have this crossroads encounter with these cultural collides. He didn't wait till the climate was perfect. No, he saw pain and he had people coming excited and he didn't wait, he engaged right away. And this is the goodness of our God. He is compassionate. 
You know, in the original language, the Greek, this word compassion is splaxnismai. You say that five times fast, okay? Splaxnismai. Yeah, whatever. And, and this is the same word used multiple times by the doctor, the physician, Luke. In Luke 7, here we see it the first time when he says, when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, don't cry. We see it in Luke chapter 10, the story of the good Samaritan. And it says that this Samaritan, he journeyed and he came where, where he saw this friend on the wayside where the priest and the Levite had gone on the other side. And it said he had compassion on him. We see this same word used where in the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. It said when the father saw the son turn and come back, it says that he arose and the, saw his father, and, but yet he was still a great way off. He had compassion and he ran and he fell on his knees and he kissed him. This is the same word that he uses, compassion. He says, I saw you when you were down and out like the, 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 the good Samaritan, unable to help yourself in a helpless situation. I saw you when you were wayward and rebellious like the prodigal son. And he says, I came and ran you down. Just so you know, that's what compassion does. And here in Luke chapter 7, he says, when, when you were walking in your pain, that you could not even think past your current reality or see anything else that's going on around you. I will step in your path. I will see you where you are and, and let you know I'm here for you. I have a powerful plan for you. I came near to you. You didn't come near to me. And this is the gospel that a God so loved the world that he gave. He came, he encountered, he loved, and he cared for us when we couldn't care for ourselves. And if you keep going down in Luke chapter 7, Concluding in this, 16 and 17, it says, they were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet appeared amongst us. They said, God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. What he's saying here is that he saw, he hears, he knows, he feels, and he reveals the goodness of who he is. That Jesus is on this road with us. That he will allow the crossroads of these cultural connections to be his place. That he will bring about his presence and engage in our lives. He gives us the goodness of God to reveal that the greatest purpose comes through our deepest pain. And that our greatest pain is where he reveals his great compassion for all in us and through us. And this is the providence of the power of God for each and every one of us. Amen. Amen. Well, I just want to uh, conclude today by praying for us and speaking these words of life over in each and every one of us. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I thank you for every friend. God, that we would find ourselves, whether it was a scent, a sound, a sight, something of the past that when it's brought to our current reality would not be a limitation, but God, it would be an awakening, an awareness. And God, we know that awareness is curative, that until we are aware of the depths of our pain, we cannot receive what the cure is for our ailment. So God, reveal to us the areas that are still needing your touch. But God, I thank you that you don't even wait for us to ask. God, you get right in front of us and you encounter us. And though there's friends in this day that are walking with Jesus that are, are just excited in the, the wonders of God, and then there's other people who are in the, the most deepest pain of their life, walking like this funeral procession. But God, you came to seek and save us all. You've come to reveal. And God, you do not ask us to divorce ourselves from our emotions with our memories. But God, you use it all for your glory. So Father, I pray, speak to every heart. Lead us in this life. Minister to us where we are. And God, I pray that you would be glorified in it all. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. And those of you that want to say yes to him, we want to invite you to say yes to Jesus today. I want to pray a prayer with you, if you would. Come on, pray. Pray with me. Come on, bow your heads. Close your eyes one more time. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Dear Jesus, 
Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Give me a brand new beginning that starts right now. I thank you as Lord, Savior, ruler of my life. I no longer live, but it's you who lives in me. Jesus, I thank you for every friend that would say yes to you today, God. Seal it. Save them. Lead them now to a place of obedience in you, God. I thank you for all of our lives unified in you that we move together as a family today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, we love you. Thank you for gathering with us today. We bless you now to be sent in the mighty name of Jesus.